name is Isis Ferguson. I'm the Associate Director of City and Community Strategy, and I want to welcome you all to the first program for this exhibition. We are really excited to have you. Um, the exhibition runs through July 6th, so if you come back between now and then, this room will be reconfigured. You can sit and stay and chat with us um, in a living room setting and then view the rest of the footage. Oh. <laughs> Not hey, <laughs> Not that's a great note. Uh, we are being recorded, apparently from many, many angles. Um, so Can TV is here with us today. So uh, video is in progress. It's very meta. We're looking at videos are being recorded. Um, but Jackie Stewart was going to moderate tonight, and it honestly takes two of us to replace her, and we just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, she, she is the brains behind this operation, and we... Um, we wish her well, she's, she's just a little bit under the weather. So Nadia and I are, are subbing in and we're gonna be in conversation. Um, we're gonna do light moderation. We really would like this to be um, a true, true conversation. Um, and then we've also sort of flipped the order because we were not thinking of Mother Nature when we uh, were considering the flow of tonight. And so later we're all going to give our attention to the screen. Um, and Candace is going to narrate as we watch some footage, but we need the sun to go down. Um, so we're going to start with the conversation and then end with the screening. I don't think there's anything else I'm supposed to. Restrooms are right out here. Um, I think that's it. So we, we are going to jump in. Um, we've asked two individuals who have very deep roots and careers in the civic and cultural of life of Chicago to be in conversation. Um, they're talking about a very broad and complex topic, and that um, is space and place, um, the notion of public space and who can traverse it. Specifically tonight, we're going to talk about parks. Um, parks are in the news. We live by parks. We want to be by parks. Um, parks are gentrifying sites. Um, and so we're going to try to unpack all of that and look at the contemporary moment and then also um, reach back uh, with this footage to the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s to see how many things have changed or how many things remain the same. Um, one of the things about sites as contested space is that in a lot of this footage, you're gonna see people at play um, and leisurely, and we, we wanna give context to that because um, that's not the only way people experience these spaces. Um, sometimes these spaces are also sites of, of danger and surveillance, and we want to think about that juxtaposition because parks are such an important part of our city um, and we're all supposed to have access to them, but uh, we, we all don't experience them in the same way. So um, Maida and Anton are gonna engage um, in a conversation because these are the people who are leading community work that is prioritizing people in place-based place -based initiatives. So their projects that they lead are ensuring that equity and justice are a part not just of the end result of the sites that they're working on, but also the process to activate them. So we've asked them to talk about those projects, but then also memories and things that these, their own personal memories, and then kind of themes that emerge from seeing the footage. And this is my colleague, Nadia. Sorry. Hey, everybody. <laughs> I'm Nadia Solomon. Um, I'm Associate Director of Community Arts and Programs here at Arts and Public Life. Um, I also want to introduce Candace Ming, um, who can give maybe a quick overview of Southside Home Movie Projects before we introduce our guests tonight as well. Hi, everybody. I'm Candace Ming, the archivist for the Southside Home Movie Project. Uh, we were founded in 2005 by Dr. Jacqueline Stewart uh, to collect, preserve, digitize, and present home movies uh, for residents here across the South Side. Uh, right now, we only collect analog film, so that's uh, these guys, yellow Kodak boxes. Uh, we digitize them and provide free digital copies to our donors. And um, our public portal, our digital archive, launched May 1st. Um, where you can actually view um, all of our collections. We have 22 collections, um, ranging from the 1920s to the late 80s. So, right. and, and if, if you have, have stuff, yeah. give it to me. <laughs> How do they do that? How do they give it to you? What's the process? Uh, wait. Call, call. Can you drop it off here? Oh, yeah. There is a drop-off box here uh, when the galleries open, Wednesday through Friday, 12 to 6. Just fill out some basic information, your social security number, your credit card information, and <laughs> then I'll um, get um, all your films digitized. Uh, all right. 
Thank you. So um, I'm going to introduce Maida, Nadia is going to introduce Anton, and then we're going to jump right into it. So Maida McNeil, many of you probably know them because they are around. They are, they are doing amazing things. Um, they're sometimes the faces in the background, but also in the foreground. So I'm sure these are um, familiar bios to you, but I, I want to do them justice and, and read them in their, in their full light. No, <laughs> no we're going to. <laughs> So um, Maida McNeil is the Arts and Cultural Culture Manager with the Chicago Park District. With her team, she supports community arts partnerships, youth arts, cultural stewardship, and civic engagement initiatives across the city's parks and cultural centers. Maida is also the director of Honeypot Performance, an Afro-feminist collective dedicated to the critical performance, to critical performance and public humanities. She received her PhD in performance studies from Northwestern University and her MFA in choreography and dance history from Ohio State University. Over the past two decades, Maida has produced numerous creative works as both a solo artist with the with Honeypot Performance, which works with works performed in Illinois, Rhode Island, Ohio, California, and Trinidad, positioning her work as an independent artist and scholar at the intersection of performance studies, dance, and critical ethnography. She has taught courses in dance, critical performance, ethnography, and black diasporic cultural production at Northwestern University. Brown University, Governor's State, and Columbia College in Chicago. Um, L. Anton Seals Jr. is a South Shore Chicago native. He's an organizer, educator, community connector, filmmaker, and entrepreneur. He does everything. <laughs> Anton's work is dedicated to service and active engagement through the use of media, arts, community organizing, and empowerment to dismantle oppressive systems impacting divested and oppressed communities. Anton started SEALS 360 Group to focus on audience community engagement, advocacy, policy, and social enterprise development. Anton is currently the lead steward of Grow Greater Inglewood, a social enter enterprise focusing on building an equitable and resilient local food system that fosters protections of vacant land in divested communities and focuses on connecting those residents with community wealth building opportunities. Anton is also the 2012 German Marshall Fellow. He is also on staff at the Egan Office of Urban Education and Community Partnership at DePaul University, training and teaching with a cross section of small and large organizations. Thank you both. <laughs> that was the condensed version. Yeah, that's okay. what I mean, by side of the twelve. We we actually shortened it a little bit. <laughs> Um, so if you actually take a look at some of the films, and we hope that you all spend some time with our collections, um, the first one does talk about, over on that side, um, shows uh, parks and um, contested spaces. So you'll see pools and parks. Um, and if you view the films, one would have the impression that people of color had full access to parks and public spaces between the 1940s and 80s. Um, but that was far from the reality. And today the situation is slightly different, but we still have a popular and dominant narrative about public spaces as democratized space. Um, for people of color, this freedom to occupy public space enmities has never truly existed. Um, so I just wanna kind of br open it up to have a conversation around um, speaking to the tensions between joy, leisure, and um, people of color as sur surveyed um, bodies in public spaces. <laughs> Sur surveillance of the bodies. Um, so yeah, I think that, uh, so good evening everybody, first of all. I'm good, got other voices in the room. <laughs> I'm just shooting out voice. But um, that's, that is a really deep question, um, very deep. Um, if I can just step back and just say like when I watch some of the films a little bit and like what it triggered for me, um, and um, uh, of course, watching these kind of things bring a sense of nostalgia. And I was just saying and sharing earlier that, you know, a lot of, you know, we had these movies as part of the, <laughs> the yearly thing that the, when the family got together. Um, and so it's an interesting thing when you start talking about, I am from South Shore, so, um, and I grew up in the 70s, a block away from a contested park, which is the, which we still call the, the South Shore folks still say the country club, you know, even though they say it's the cultural center. But the circle of people in which I was raised around, the Ujima family, in which I kind of was a loose 
body of folks who kind of started, you know, Afrocentric schools in the 70s, and it's a thousand of us cousins out here um, who do all kinds of different stuff. But it triggered that initially because, you know, growing up we had no clue that people were fighting for this space. We just lived a block away from the lake, and we had access to it. And so part of it, I think, is this um, <clears throat> gets to your question around this um, um, this disconnection, in a way, around those two realities of you, you know, this kind of privilege of living in the space that was vacated, um, and growing up being unaware of all of that, but being part of it, but not aware of like the implications of all of that. And I think that's what's buried in that tension is, yes, you can kind of come and move in spaces in ways that are very much, in particular being black in Chicago, and from my era, now that, I, now that I'm a middle-aged guy, never had that fear of going into spaces um, from white people in particular. Like that was not something that was part of the experience. It was often like if we're walking into a scene or a set, we good, you know what I mean? I was always like, ain't nobody gonna mess with us. Um, so it triggers all of that and I think in that is this sense of like ownership, claiming an identity. Um, and so the larger question around surveillance um, and um, around the attachment to ownership and, and community around public space, I think it's still something that is ongoing. Of course, you know, that framework that I just talked about is also kind of, you know, there's all these different intersections in my story where, you know, that is interrupted, where you are stopped by the police and you are, you know, hanging out at the point or you're hanging out, you know what I mean, at the, at the country club and you're going to the secret beach or, you know, because that's what we did as teenagers, like that was our playground. Um, and the, the flip side in terms of the actual community d during the 70s and 80s, I think is also kind of like, there was a sense of danger around gang culture for sure. So there were certain parks you did not go to, um, and I won't go too f far into that, but there is this kind of sense now that we lived under this moniker of Chirac for the last eight years, right? It's interesting because during our day, there were, the gangs were real. Right, so there was a whole process. Like you just couldn't just claim you was GDE or folks or nothing. Like you had to be blessed in, and so that happened at parks. <laughs> so you didn't go to like Rose and Bloom Park because that's where all the moles were, and if you were up there, you was gonna get a buking, right? And so that whole language of you know, especially being from South Shore, which was a little different too than you know than High Park for sure. So it was. People, black people have had of affluence and artists, but it had an edge, where Hyde Park was much more this kind of, what we think of like the di diversity of all the different cultures. South Shore was like a diversity of all these different black people living in the community. So I think all of that e evoked that from that question. I hope that answered it somewhat, gave a context. Yes, hello, all right. Um, so I think I also want to start with just like what I viewed, um, and I think the what the the piece of footage that I looked at was mostly white bodies on in park space um, in the early you know, half of the 20th century, um, and it had me thinking about you know who get who who had access, um, who gets whiteness getting kind of uh, uh, conflated with joy and leisure and play. Um, and uh, thinking about b black bodies, not you know, as uh, being more associated with uh, work or not joy and not freedom and not you know, um, not having access. Um, and then it had me thinking about some historical moments. Um, so thinking about the um, uh, 1919 uh, riots and. There was a beach. Uh, it was like between 20th and 30th streets, and a black boy waded into the uh, white part of the, you know, the beach, the water, and was beaten and uh, killed. Um, and then thinking about Marquette Park in the 60s and MLK doing a, a walk through, um, a march through the park and being hit, you know, with bricks. Um, 
And so parks and those, you know, not being safe for black bodies. Uh, but then thinking about um, how does that, that physical violence shift forms? <laughs> uh, and thinking about, and I think one of the, you know, the physical violence, I think we still see some of that, but I think there's also this question of resources and who has access to resources in the city, in the parks. Um, I think we find in our work that um, a lot of time, um, not every Northside Park, but a lot of the Northside Parks feel like they've, they've got it. They've got the resources. The communities feel like they are entitled or um, empowered to ask for what they want in parks and feel like they have a right to get those things. And I feel like we have to do a lot more work um, with South Side and West Side communities to, to have them understand that those are your parks and you can ask park staff for certain things and uh, we can build a process in which we are working together to have your needs met. Um, yeah, so let me start there. Yeah, and if I could just add, I think you brought up a good point. It just made me think about the juxtaposition of our two angles because just thinking about the larger question immediately took me to like the sense of that I li that particularly we lived in a maybe a a bubble um, <laughs> in South Shore in that sense like that was our shit right and like I don't know what these other people are talking about like that sense of ownership right and that sense of pride in the community that sense of self determination um, that it was very much prevalent. You know, and it's interesting in the work because that is the case when you're talking about the larger piece around connection to park and what that meant, you know, moving. Um, but I'm often thinking about the layers to this onion, you know what I mean? And so oftentimes we think of the layer around, you know, in particular Marquette Park and our uh, work we were doing in, in Inglewood. And I think people forget like Inglewood's like two communities over, so it was very much, and we'll talk about that, like contested space. Um, but you made me really think about that around black identity being self-determining, right? And having that privilege of growing up in a space where it's like, yeah, we, we're supposed to have this. And I mean, still to this day, like, you know, even though I'm, I'm not a, an elected official, like, South Shore, that's my neighborhood, you know what I mean? Like, and this is like, you damn right you're supposed to be painting that, you know what I mean? I'm paying for it, right? And so it's that kind of mentality that you kind of grew up with uh, that is very much, to me, you know, part of the identity of a lot of people from South Shore in that sense. That sense of ownership or self-determination that you can use the park as you want, um, you have a deep connection to the park as much as you want or need. Another word that I, I know both of you um, utilize and, and root your work in is stewardship. So the cultural stewardship of, of a place. So can you, can you kind of talk about that as a practice for how um, it's guiding the current work that you're both doing in the neighborhoods that you're working in? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was super excited when we had that conversation and I, and I heard that in your work, um, especially because we'll be, um, so one of the, the things that we're doing in the parks with the uh, uh, arts and culture unit uh, and our 15 cultural centers throughout the city, which I didn't know we had when I came into the parks and I grew up in Chicago, right? Uh, a lot of people don't know that these park cultural centers exist. Um, so we've been working with them three at a time every, uh, th three um, in a cohort every year, uh, where we go through this kind of long, uh, year long process to try to um, help build some deeper connections and understandings between park staff and their roles and their, you know, what's expected of them as they uh, kind of um, um, are taking care of these parks and their roles. Um, and community members who come in and, and want, you know, different kinds of programming. Um, and then local artists we want to engage into those parks. And we're taking them through a kind of year-long process so that they understand each other's roles better as agents um, so that they can think about how do we come to consensus and that it's not a, sh you know, um, it takes a long time to do that, right? Yeah. And it takes experimenting and failing and loss of language and me not understanding you and but us coming back to a table and saying we're gonna work through this. And so we've been, with, with varying success through the past four years, <laughs> we have been going through that process but we'll be at South Shore next year, so that'll be an interesting thing. And so I was excited about that um, when we spoke this morning. But 
cultural stewardship, I think, um, as I came into the parks, I was like, how are all these things united? Um, what connects them in the kind of services, what we provide in terms of arts and cultural resources to folks? Um, and really, it felt like it, it was about arts and civic action, right? And thinking about um, parks, these public spaces, as kind of civic laboratories where folks can come in. Um, we should be encouraging folks to come in and take those risks to experiment, to think about how do we share space together, how do we live good together, um, and, and to be um, open to um, going through those, the, the difficult points. And I, which I think this is where we often kind of stop, drop the ball, is when it gets hard um, and it feels risky, um, we want to go for the easy solution. Um, and so I think through stewardship, we're thinking about how, how do we have that long-term process of caretaking um, and thinking about these parks as belonging to everyone. Yeah. I mean, for us, I mean, I, we're using uh, the, the framework around stewardship, the way that we, um, we kind of came to, like I call my, so my title is the lead steward as opposed to just as an executive director or a co-founder. It was really steeped in, you know, a historical context around, um, you know, all of the people who kind of poured into me and really gave me a framework in which I'm able to stand on. So that, you know, that kind of ancestral piece, but in particular around, you know, African Americans, Africans, in particular, in our space in this country around space and stewardship, you know, that Africans had been stewards of the earth. And so this kind of came out of a conversation we were having, like, you know, we're having like black people in the environmental circles kind of thing. I'm like, yeah, because it's a different language and it's what we've been doing, right? And this is why we're even on this side of the Atlantic, right? It's because they brought certain skills and labor to help with the land, right? In order to bring, make profit, to extract profit from the land, right? But they didn't just go get anybody. There were certain people, tribes, who had specialties, who grew rice, who grew, you know, who knew the environment, who could withstand the, that environment. And so our thrust is to really connect, because there's this damage also in, in our culture, in, in black Americans' culture, particularly around land and what that means. So there's a barrier, even if it's not spoken, around access to land. Um, working on land. There's still that barrier there. And so what we're attempting to do is to say, um, with Grow Greater Inglewood in that project, is not a park yet. It's an abandoned railroad line and a bunch of vacant lots. So the question is, is like then, who claims this space again, right? And what does it mean for the public? What is, are we, how, how do we define the public moving forward? So we're really um, attempting to be really an intentional around this notion of stewardship, which is different than ownership as well. So I was also breaking that down to someone like, oh, well, ownership means, I was like, but you don't own the earth, the earth owns you. You know, we have to remember that, that we are products of the earth. You do not get to stay here forever. You have to return to the earth, right? And that we're just stewards in this process. And I, that's the shared humanity. Everybody goes through that process. So it's also like that's the connective tissue in our minds that also will help um, bring forth some of the healing. Um, and all of that is kind of big lofty ideas, but I think at the end of it is like, you know, how do you caretake for, you know, the land? And the land, and our, when we go up in our space in, in Inglewood, there's this, so it's on 58th and Halsted from, how you doing? Uh, from Halsted to Damon, so it's about two miles. Um, but it's like an oasis when you walk up in a space that's like probably in most people's imagination, some, and it used to be, because my, my mom and them lived on Sagamon, you know, a real wild spot. You know, if you didn't, you know, if they didn't know you, what were you doing there? You know, and a lot of tragedies that happened, but you go up here and it's that nature has reclaimed the space, right? There's a canopy of trees that goes as far as like a green carpet. And so um, when people who live there even go up there, they're like, man. And so I was just reading recently around how trees and all that kind of really give, um, are really already talking. So to me, like all of that is around this notion of stewardship in my mind um, and what that means and that how they're stewarding to us too, that, that nature is stewarding to us and giving us lessons. 
Can, can I just um, bring up because, so one of the programs that um, is, is under our youth arts kind of suite of programs uh, from early childhood to teen, uh, the teen program is called Trace. Um, and we have a hub uh, at um, Hamilton, uh, in uh, Hamilton Park in Inglewood. And uh, Anton has hey, been working with Trace. Yes, yeah, right. So <laughs> could you talk a little bit about how you're, you know, so, um, yeah, so Trace is awesome. I mean, it's a great program that's been around. Um, and I'm fortunate to saw it from its inception when Carla and Andres, mm -hmm. and they started on like the west side and, um, and how it's grown. So Marcus is stewarding that program now. Um, so we hooked up last year and what we started to do is, uh, Marcus is a filmmaker and does a lot of ethnography and so forth, but we wanted to capture backyard stories, so we were trying to capture, because a lot of our work outside of just this trail was also converting vacant lots into farms. Um, so the food culture and the history, so we did this backyard garden series, and we had young people take pictures of people's gardens and then tell their story of their families in Inglewood, right, and their connection to, to what they're growing. So we want to also give the other side of the story that people continue these traditions mm -hmm. from up south, um, as they would call Chicago. Um, and that that lived on and it's buried not so far out of sight in these neighborhoods where people are growing things in their backyards or on their front stoop. Um, and we want to capture that because the baby boomers were that last kind of generation that kind of really migrated in the late 40s you know, late, early 40s, uh, late 40s to Chicago. Um, and so some of them are now, you know, in their 70s and 80s. Um, so we want to give voice to that. So they've been really, and we're st partnering, continue, our partnership continues in doing uh, arts and murals. Uh, and we're working on one right now mm -hmm. for the entry point to this Inglewood uh, Trail. Yeah. So they dope, all the way dope. <laughs> um, so everything that happens in parks is not dire. Um, and I think some of the best traditions um, in, in our neighborhoods uh, take place in parks. So there's the Bud Billiken Parade, um, there's the house picnic in Jackson Park, there are family reunions and barbecues, um, there's baseball right here in, in Washington Park, there, there's Imans taking it to the streets. And, and so I, I also want us to lift up and talk about um, some of these informal and formal ways that people gather and the role that ritual plays in parks and ritual plays in families if you all can talk about that from your own life or, or from, from the work that you're, you're currently doing? Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, here I would want to lift up a couple of like um, amazing platforms and, and programs that are um, in, the, in the parks. Um, so I think the night out in the parks, um, that platform has really grown in the past kind of five years to uh, become this amazing space in which um, anyone can propose in a kind of arts and cultural project in um, the parks, receive a budget, some support to do that thing. And um, we're seeing like this, you know, amazing range from kind of uh, young artists to teen groups to uh, established companies who are doing things in the parks. Um, and I think a couple of them that um, I'm really excited about are kind of Sierra McKissick uh, with her um, AMFM gallery. She's been doing kind of curating, uh, bringing this kind of young, hip, um, <laughs> black queer edge into the parks. Um, and so I think that's, you know, an amazing thing. Um, and uh, we have a, a bunch of um, arts partners and residents in the parks who also take part in that pro program. So we've got um, Vershawn um, Sanders Ward, I think I'm saying her name correctly. Um, who runs Red Clay Dance, and she's doing, Nikki, are you here? Yeah. Yeah, the, the um, what is the, she's doing this, uh, the La Femme? Yeah, it's 2019 actually, though. La Femme, uh, they're gonna be doing, uh, actually Sasha Folk Film Center in Yeah, so I think like, you know, it's amazing that we can kind of bring projects like that into park space, and they don't have to be in black box theaters or whatever, you know, they can be in park spaces. Um, 
And then besides that, like in terms of just like, parks are just amazing. Like I grew up in the city and there are so many parks that I've only just discovered in gyms um, by uh, working there, you know, um, like the Columbus Park and that, that garden uh, through that, like, what? I didn't know, you know? Um, and so I think that like people create kind of a uh, ritual by taking, you know, just taking space in these beautiful natural areas and the, and the buildings, which are also di different, yeah. right? Um, I think what I would just add is that the, the rituals that I think are most present, um, especially as this has come up around Jackson Park, the, the, this big South Park uh, project here, mm -hmm. um, you know, and um, this presidential center being located in this park, and people were saying it's going to disrupt the, the rituals of, like, that's where people gather to have barbecues. And, um, and so there was this kind of um, friction that still is out here around preservationists, around this, this conversation around preserving, you know, the nature part of it, which I totally um, get. But I think the other part of it is like the cultural piece on like how people from that space use the space, which is, you know, loud music, tons of smoke of all kinds. Yeah. Yeah. And it's an aroma that, you know what I mean, almost know that like it's like a sensory like, you know, the summer's here mm -hmm. when you hit when you smell that and you hear that. Um, and I think that's a ritual that I think is, you know, distinctly black Chicago for sure, but then you can see it, you know, in particular um, in other neighborhoods, how that also plays out, the sounds uh, and those rituals, right? So like the kite festival that folks have, you know, events that bring people from all over the city to different parts. So I think there's this, you know, um, balance, um, but in particular I think about when I think about ritual and how people access that and how they create like this is my little spot. Um, the other thing that I think is like it's the park but we don't think of it as is the lakefront. So like being from a lakefront community you're like you know you can sit on the beach and have a meeting like I'm all with that. <laughs> so like and you see people like that that's part of the ritual of heal healing. So it goes back to your first question around leisure mm -hmm. and rest um, and that whole concept in particular being um, from different points of view, from different cultures and what rest means and what leisure means. Um, but I think that also becomes a ritual. Uh, when I think about that, I think about um, like the, well, Mama Carol's not here, but the, all the mamas and the babas, like the congas at 63rd Street, like, mm -hmm. like being from that neighborhood evokes like everything in my little brain here, like, wow, you know what I mean? And it's like, it's where your imagination is like, just let free. And I think that's the, the power of the rituals too, that you, you know, but we don't call them that though. I think we don't claim ritual. You all talked about this a lot already, I think, but, um, sort of thinking about how we build long-term relationships that lead to safer and better parks that respond to culturally relevant needs that the communities that they're in, like how, do, how does that happen and how are you thinking about that? That's an ongoing, <laughs> that's an ongoing process. Uh, so I wish all of these things were like destinations. They are not, they are, um, <laughs> they are like a trip. These, this is the railroad. Um, I would say, um, Man, uh, that's an ongoing, because there's so many different, and the work that we're doing in Inglewood is challenging in that sense. So you're dealing with, you know, I was just at a conference today talking about, like, you know, this framework of, like, everything that you can think of in terms of how we think of Chirac, you think of this neighborhood. But then it's out of context when you start talking to the people who live there, <laughs> like, who, like, whose the grandfather worked like three or four jobs to buy this little house, right? And it's a beautiful house that was built in like 18 something, right? Um, but then seeing how people like are so like, like uh, parks, and even though this is not a park, it is just a lot, you know what I mean? But the, the land is like so far removed from like, I own that, right? So even that's what I'm saying, I had to acknowledge my own sense of privilege coming in into a space where I'm like thinking of like, this yours, you know what I mean? 
you know, care for it. And I think that's, for me, like a big part of like the work is to be able to tap into, you know, people using the space and then building on what people are already doing in the space, right? Um, and I think that's a big part of the ongoing work. Now I would say outside of like just the Inglewood work, just in parks in general, because I did nights out in the park and, and we did, um, this is my work through in DePaul with the Chicago Police Department, we were doing healing circles. So this was the first iteration of uh, what became uh, Bridging the Divide program at the YMCA and then led to like, this ready program. So it's great how these things that are seeds can then just, you know, because that's been our thing is like just be the catalyst. Like you don't have to claim something and hold on to it. That's not the purpose. Like just let it, you know, it's like a flower from above as the emotion song would say. So I think of that. And so being able to have and create space where people can tap into that joy and imagination is part of my purpose. Um, and so I think that's important. Um, part of like, you know, so we're still working to try to figure out like, well, what does that mean for you? <laughs> so that we can at least keep a seat at the table for you. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I just, I think it requires just a radical shift in how we, I mean, I think your own point is not a, it's not a destination, it is a process. And we have to be able, we have to be comfortable like just living in that state of process, perpetual process, and that we are always um, cr we cr trying to create structures that enable folks to come to a, um, a, a table that's always changing, right? Um, but that we kind of set some parameters for how we talk to each other and engage each other at that table, right? Um, so that we might come to consensus to like build and keep moving things along. Um, and I feel like that's, that's the work that we're in, engaged in as a, a unit and a department within the parks uh, that we sometimes have, to, we, we have challenges with, with other uh, dimensions of the parks. Um, because there is often a um, desire in the society we live in to have kind of a top-down approach or just make a decision about a thing or just throw this programming here. Or, um, and we are thinking more about, we gotta sit here for three months <laughs> and keep coming back to the table and chart out some plans and some ideas and tussle it out and decide which of the ideas that uh, pan out best for the widest range of people um, and that will have the most impact and let's move on those. And once we finish those, what does that lead to? What's the uh, red come tra trail that will lead to the next thing? And we're gonna keep doing that. Um, and and I th so that comes back again to this idea of stewardship. And like we hold the work for the piece, a piece of the way, um, but then we're gonna leave a clear pathway for others to pick up the work um, and keep, keep going. I have one more yeah. thing. I think the other thing I, that, I, you know, is a big part of, is this notion of fear in this city that is tremendous, right? Um, and I think that's also a big part of it. It's like, you can't do this because this would happen. And I think that's what's like really, mm -hmm. um, it's bigger than the parks, but it's the, this kind of vibe of the city that has shifted around safety, of not feeling safe. Um, and you know that pressure, that stress of that even outside is not so that becomes a a barrier. Some people speak it, some people don't. And when you were talking just now, made it just made me think about like you know when my father and my uncles and you know mom like people used to sleep in the parks, you know like go out and listen like that was not an uncommon thing. Mm -hmm. And if you mention that to someone now, they're like, you must be out your rabbit ass mind. Mm -hmm. Right, like you, why would I want to be sleeping outdoors? Um, and then you also made me think of this notion when I was in my youth, um, doing you know the heyday of the 90s, right? And it was even more chaotic, I think, then than it was now. The story was not being told the way that it is being told now. But us being like, you know, how the park gonna close at 11 o'clock? You know what I mean? And we just hitting the streets, like, how you gonna close the earth? I remember we had like, 
You know what I mean? Having our, you know, stars, quasar moment in the back of a car, like, man, how they gonna close the earth? Like, who closes the earth? Like, who gives you the right to close the earth, right? You can't go on the beach at a, and I remember that when you were just talking, like, I, for, I almost forgot about that, like that being a big part of the youth culture, you know, on that tail end of, the, of that house scene, like, you know, we were out to four or five o'clock in the morning, and a sense of safety um, and moving around was a, was there was a tinge of danger, but it was, it's nothing like it is now, and I think that's something that needs to be further analyzed and talked about and unpacked and then acted on, um, because that's what's driving people away from this city. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I also wanted to, I think one of the an interesting thing that's happening um, is that I feel like we've got a younger generation now that is pushing in some ways that is making older generation uh, uncomfortable um, in leadership positions um, and in terms of wanting to put kind of uh, queer issues, L LGBTQ issues, trans issues, these notions about alternative policing on the table. And um, I feel like we, 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 we're at the moment where we're going to have to deal with that. Like those older folks are going to have to get over um, a discomfort or fear of, you know, thinking about these alternative ways of uh, being in space together, um, it, I, I feel like we're shifting that way. It's going to happen, you know. Um, you lead to my very next question about poking through that fear um, and safety as kind of this frame around space. So can you all point to um, courageous or innovative leaps either in legislation or policy or design that have led to transformation of some of these spaces, whether beach or trails um, or park-like spaces? And it doesn't have to be here in Chicago. It could be somewhere else that it would be great for us to adopt. No, there's spaces. I mean, so I hate to, I'll do two. But I gotta go back to South Shore. The, the nature sanctuary is the joint, you know what I mean? It has the fire pits and it has all of the flowers and the, all of the milkweeds and it's, it's it's like one of the best kept secrets, you know what I mean? And so um, it has been contested because of the expansion of this golf course, which, you know, I'm not like a hardliner, like, oh, no, it's a golf course now. It's not like, you know, so for many people, it's like, what's the big idea? But you're trying to take away the sanctuary and you're about to take away my private beach. Like, what y'all talking about, right? You're trying to, you know, uh, so then their response is like, oh, we're going to help the erosion, which I'm like, well, the private beach is almost no private beach now because it's like gone, <laughs> right? Because the erosion is real. But um, that's the whole tension of public versus this private space. Um, but that had always been the, the nature of the parks to begin with around patrons, you know, contributing to space that they would then share right, as a de democratic value, right, that shows this democratic value. Um, the other space I would say, which if you guys haven't, um, is that I had the fortune of um, working on um, the Burning Wildlife Corridor, the Roots and Routes um, project, which is, um, my man JC is in the back, the Field Museum, and bringing this connection between black and brown communities, between black and Latino communities particularly, um, in Bronzeville and in Pilsen, like using this, but then it ended up expanding, right? When we start, and you know, creating um, different gathering spaces, right? Um, how many of you guys have been to the Wildlife Corridor? Oh, y'all gotta go check it out. Go right here on 47th Street, and you just you can walk all the way to McCormick Place, and it's it's beautiful. Well, you can't right now because they're building a bridge, but it'll be back open. Yeah, they're building that bridge. But that's another great space, I think, that, you know, using it to transform, which was kind of like seen as like a dead zone where it's like railroad tracks. Um, and the Nature Sanctuary was built recently, was it early, late 90s. Um, and so that also came out of like, so I think, you know, if, even if they did pr proceed, it's like, if you're going to take it away, you got to build something even bigger. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you got to... Like, that's the trade-off. Like, if we built that, and then if you're gonna try to take it away or move it, I need, uh, like, five of those <laughs> or something, you know what I mean? But I would rather, like, that to me is a real uh, sacred space, though, 
because you can, you know, just look out, and I think people utilize it in that way, but don't, it's not one of those things that are promoted in that way, and I like that. Um, but those are the two that kind of pop into my head. I was, I was gonna say BWC as well, um, and I, just, I gotta keep focusing on people. Um, I, one of the things I love about um, the Urban Wildlife Corridor is, you know, those five gathering spaces um, that there were kind of, you know, these communities who galvanized around them and then artists who were kind of uh, leading the creation of these, the, the actual spaces. Um, and to see all of that get activated, I think, is amazing. And the way it keeps getting, um, keeps getting activated. So I think that there are still uh, community groups who are thinking about like doing, you know, programming around specific spaces, right? And then even one of uh, our youth programs, Young Cultural Stewards, they, their whole uh, summer camp programming schedule is around two of those spaces and really digging into the practices of um, Sapphire and Crystals, um, which is a, a black women's uh, artist collective. Um, and uh, Hector Duarte, who uh, from Pilsen, mural, uh, muralist, uh, who also created one of the uh, spaces. So I think um, that's an amazing thing. And then another space, which is kind of like, it was like a gorilla space when I came in. It was like um, in Thule Park, in the basement, uh, in the Chatham neighborhood, there, were, uh, there was a group um, of older artists who were just, Holding up made an arts incubator space. We're down there practicing um, and doing light programming with the rest of the park. Uh, had a community volunteer who was um, a woman named Marion Haynes, who um, has since passed, who was uh, like really coordinating and stewarding that space with them. But it was all kinds of wild art, sculpture, painting. Um, and we are in the process now of trying to revive that and build a new incubator down there that would be kind of a mix of emerging and established artists in that neighborhood. So. I, I do have two more that I would say just <laughs> mention. That y'all gotta go check them out because we got dope ass parks. Uh, Steel Workers Park is the newest one. It's one of my favorites. It's They're like, putting a wall, a rock climbing wall. There's a rock climbing wall, but even if you just go back there, it's uh, the new, you know, it's in South Chicago. My granddaddy lived like right on 80th and South Shore Drive, so you never used to be able to go over there because it was the the steel mill, um, which my dad worked at at one point. Um, and the other one is Big Marsh, mm -hmm. so it's also one of my other um, favorite places, um, which is right off us, of, kind of on the Calsack, uh, southern end. But you should go out there. They built like somewhat of a bike park. Um, you know, I'm halfway a biker, been part of the slow road movement, but mm. um, but nonetheless, Obai and the whole slow, like really pushing to have like that also as a space to transform, to get in particular more black people on bikes, biking, um, and then also, you know, giving a space for the ones that, there are tons of them who already do, who are like BMXs, and it's a really cool space. Mm -hmm. Um, so something that, so Isis and I, along with some other folks, uh, co-curated the show. And I think something that we acknowledged while we were doing this was that not everybody had access to a camera. Um, and it was particular families that did have access. Um, and now I think folks, most people have cell phones now and they're able to record things. And so we were kind of wondering um, what you imagine will be recorded, preserved and archived for future home movie viewers. Um, you know, we, we kind of see what the 1940s through the 1980s kind of held. Um, will it look similar? Do you think it'll look different? You know, this is a, that's a... Um, it's a futuristic a, kind well, of Well, no, that's a really good, I mean, because I'm, you know, some of my work is in media and documentary film and that kind of, that, I have three different kind of worlds. But um, technology has shifted so much of our understanding, I think, around images, how we see them, because everything now is captured. There's not much. I mean, this this whole notion of selfies, like as a as a frame, like you take pictures of yourself, like you look at some of those, like you were not able to take your own pictures in that way without a mirror, like um, maybe a Polaroid, but 
barely, you know what I mean? And I think that it hasn't, oh, there's Jeanette right there, there's mama, yeah, they just know her exactly. Wow. <laughs> um, but I think that, you know, that's a really, that's, you know, you know, like what else would be left though? And I, I think that is what I'm curious about around what the future would hold, like what else would be left if you know every, you know, moment, there's like nothing that is left. And I think that is influencing like how we're relating to each other because there is nothing like sacred in a way, but then becomes a barrier where there's a lot of stuff that is actually kept from you. So you think that you're knowing. So it's kind of an illusion, I think, that the technology is created in a way. So I'm really interested in, um, so I don't know what the future would hold um, and how much, um, there may be more efforts in which there's an actual narrative that can be documented easier um, and told from different points of view. I think that would be really interesting, like really seeing an event from several people's eyes as opposed to just one. Rashomon. Rashomon, one of my favorites, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's like, you know, who saw this event from that eyes, you know what I mean? And. Because, you know, that's the power of the story is that every person gets to see it and tell it in a different way. So maybe that will be part of the future. Hmm. Uh, I'm just really interested in the way that um, uh, and excited about the way that young people are uh, documenting themselves, their communities, um, and taking up this notion of curation and all these really different, just blowing that concept up um, um, and I'm, I love that we see a lot of it happening in the parks so um, I'm interested to see how that unfolds so I'm gonna hand my microphone off to you all so you can be a part of this conversation before we then shift into seeing the footage and hearing from the wonderful Candace who will explain to us what we're seeing. So um, I'm just gonna walk this to whoever wants to get us started um, and ask some questions. Don't jump up at once. Hi, thank you so much for speaking. Um, I'm Sarah, I just moved here from DC where we talk about contested spaces a lot, um, especially where everything is gentrifying. Um, one park in particular, Malcolm X Park, uh, it used to be a primarily black space. Um, now that more and more like young white people are getting hip to like the drum circle that happens on Sundays, it's not so much a black space anymore. And it's probably, I, I mean, I don't know the history of how it was policed before, but it's policed now. So I'm curious kind of about that dynamic and about especially how parks are policed in Chicago. Um, so I'll just, one of the, the, um, the community process I mentioned at the, the beginning, this recenter process, we saved two parks for last. <laughs> because we knew they were going to be um, challenging in terms of these, uh, in particular these discussions around gentrification. Um, Humboldt Park, South Shore. Um, and so um, we've been just trying to get ready with like what are our tools for building these larger conversations between park staff, communities, and artists. Um, in order to be able to engage um, those spaces, which I know are gonna be difficult. I mean, I don't have an answer. I'm just saying we're seeing it um, and we're trying to get ourselves ready <laughs> with tools that we'll be able to um, be, you know, use for that, those conversations. Yeah, I think um, this term gentrification comes up a lot now, you know but I don't think people really understand or unpack it. Like, so, you know, when we talk about this, um, you know, who is the gentry, right? And do we see that just on racial lines? Do we see how, like, how do we see that? Um, and I think it connotates certain things for sure. Ain't no doubt about it. So it's not being confused. This is around 
asking another set of questions, I think, around, because none of these spaces, so I always go back and look at, like, South Shore was, like, in my building. I lived on 70th and Oglesby. There was still, like, white folks left over. They didn't catch the flight, <laughs> right? They missed the plane, right? So they stuck around. It was like, okay, they were always part of the fabric of, but these, the schools we went to, the churches we, the, you know, these were white spaces, right? And they used to be pretty much called that. I think it becomes an opportunity potentially for us to kind of address some of like what this notion is around for the next generation to follow around what that means for, you know, black spaces or, you know, when we say that as, quote unquote, as Americans, right, in these spaces that are supposed to be shared. And um, does one have access to, you know, that identity? Um, and then the policing question, I think this is also something that is um, troublesome because we have um, um, this dissonance in our country where you have the police state emerging before our eyes and like not being able to ask these certain set of questions. And that's usually how in history it kind of happens. By the time you ask, it's like they really don't care what color you are. I think that's also embedded in that. It's like the history, you know what I mean? Like there's a reason like all of these Europeans came to America. They were looking for something better than what they had at that space in that time. You know what I mean? So I think it gives an opportunity for us to unpack all of that. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I think the gentrification question is something that I would like for us to spend a lot more time on around identifying what we mean when we say the gentrifiers, right? Um, yeah. I think we also have um, video documentation now of other citizens who are taking on this policing of other bodies in these spaces. So we have um, these videos of um, folks doing exactly what you're supposed to do in parks, which is uh, the electric slide or using your grill in the grill designated area. Um, but you have other folks taking on that, that authoritative role of um, policing other people's joy. Um, and so I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I know that these, these things are rubbing up against each other in these spaces um, and you're seeing some interesting results. Thanks. Uh, hi, Eric Rogers. Um, I know as a frequent uh, user of the South Shore Cultural Center Park and a white user, um, you know, I've benefited from disparate policing there. Um, so, you know, I've, I've seen it firsthand because of those fire circles, that is the joint. Um, and, you know, I know what the police say to me uh, when they see me back there with something in a red solo cup, um, and I can guess what they say to a black person uh, when they see them there doing the same thing. Um, but my actual question, and I actually did not come here with this ax to grind in mind, but um, you know, this has been a great conversation about parks as sites of cultural production, um, and I, as part of what I do for a living, working for the Chicago Architecture Foundation, I visit a lot of parks, I take a lot of photos. Um, you know, parks are frequently the most beautiful places in all of our communities. Um, this past weekend, I visited several parks in back of the yards. Um, my reception when I walked into those parks with a camera bag was not, welcome to this park, this is very cool, here's what to check out. It was, no photos allowed. I really am having an increasingly hard time understanding how the park district relates to photography, especially, you know, I understand um, if you're doing a wedding photo shoot with three assistants and a lighting rig and things like that, um, you know, you're disrupting other users of the park. Um, but if I'm trying to come document a beautiful old building or, you know, a nature sanctuary or something, to be yelled at um, has just, it's become increasingly, um, disheartening. <laughs> and I know at the South Shore Cultural Center, there's a placard at the front that says no photography unless it's with a cell phone <laughs> anywhere in the park at all, um, which I don't think is actually the real policy. Um, but yeah, I'm just really baffled by that and increasingly angry about it. <laughs> Wait, maybe that I was kind of talking about because, uh, you know, we kind of got into it a little bit. I had an event there and... <laughs> 
had to do my 71st Street bid like, and that means what to who, <laughs> kind of thing, right? Because like, like, you know, who are these people making this decision? And like, n not just in terms of the eye, but it's like, almost was an affrontage, like, you know what I mean? Because that is the rule, like, you can't be in here. I'm like, well, who came up with that dumb ass shit? You know, in my, my mind, like, who says this is a rule that everyone should follow? And then you see a certain set, like, you know, your colleagues, and so I won't, I'm allowing you to be off the hook, because I don't work there. <laughs> hey, I, you can't say all of this, but it's like, yeah, like, you know, there's this issue, in particular, and this will come up probably next year, around the country club, I mean, the cultural center, how it's being used as a production for, uh, as a money maker, right, as a private space that is then rented out, um, and that being an, another extractive tool without many of the people even understanding the history of like, they was about to throw this in the garbage and we had to fight for it and for to have a new set, like so the context usually is always getting lost in like the bureaucracy of something that has to happen. And we were speaking a little earlier, like, you know, then the park district is like a quasi governmental agency as well. So it's definitely a public body, but it's also very private. So, you know, it's one of those things that I think that is like, um, gives a lot of um, power to individuals to make up rules. But I think it's just like, you know, bringing this issue up and then us saying like, yo, Mike, you know what I mean? Like, and going to the, to the board, right? And it's like, um, I think one of the big things that'll probably come out that we, you know, should be pushing for is like, stop having these damn meetings in the middle of the day when everybody working at 12 o'clock. Like, bring the stuff out to the community, these board meetings, Chicago board meetings, because people can't, so they end up, a lot of the, some of the commissioners I know always complain, like, you get the same people's like, because you're gonna get the retired people, because they can come downtown at one o'clock in the afternoon, right, or you're gonna get the, town crier, you know, you know what I'm talking about, who's there every board meeting and will wax poetically about whatever, right? But you're not gonna capture all of the people because they're like, I'm at work and I can't take off to come to your meeting. I'm sorry. So that in itself is somewhat undemocratic. It's like I, and I think that's the nature of what you're talking about is like we have these things like, oh, we have it, but you just gotta fit into like where it's convenient for us. I think as a people, we have to push and say, like, it's not 1975, it's, not, it's 2018. So I think that's a great campaign that we just got started in here. <laughs> Can you pass the mic back to the gentleman? Can I ask two questions sequentially? Ask, ask that first one and then we'll see. Yeah. Do you, <laughs> do you think the Obama Presidential Center can function as a black space? by the parameters that you've been talking about? Uh-oh, you're trying to get me in trouble, no. <laughs> the answer is no, I don't. Can you tell me why? Um, as one of the co-founders of this Community Benefits <laughs> Agreement campaign, I would say, uh, I don't know if I'm a founder, that wasn't the right language, but conveners, who asked this question, if I, you know, the, the whole thrust was not around the center itself, was around the catalyst of, that it would have on neighborhoods. That it was a great thing that it was coming. But I think what people, what's pent up is, is that people want a hero and they kind of have it, but then they're like, you know, he's not going to, to the mat for you in certain issues. So it's like, with this space coming, it's like, yeah, you're bringing all this stuff, but it's like, the way things happen in Chicago is like, oh yeah, that, that did happen, oops, you know what I mean? And it's like, it's too late, you know what I mean, when things have become privatized. And that's what we as Chicagoans know. So um, the other part of that is, um, you know, I would dare to say like, you know, I, I, I come out of a political background as an organizer, you know, so, you know, I worked for who he, uh, who defeated him. So I have a really interesting story around Barack and Bobby Rush. So, yeah, which was, I canvassed for Barack when he was running for Congress, when I used to have long hair, and he was looking for young people, you know, so we, and I think when, when I stopped working for the campaign was when he started talking about housing, and the whole framework at the time was around a third, a third, a third, which was public, um, affordable, and market rate. But the whole notion was built on, like, 
if the market rate doesn't sell, we're not going to increase public housing, right? You don't get those affordable units. You have to, like, that was the offset. And what we've seen since then is, like, there is no public housing anymore. It's not even a notion. It's like a, it's in the museum, basically. We actually, we're getting a museum, the public housing museum, right? So the country has moved away from, like, housing is not a right. It's like, you know what I mean? Um, we've... And I think that's going to come up again because it's like you've got you know huge income inequality, all of that. So when you start talking, this is the issue that, I, and I'm getting to your question, which is that do I think it will be a black space? No, you know what I mean. Not in the way black Chicagoans would think of it as a black space, right? And I think that's part of the tension, is that underneath there, there had never been a resolution around black people didn't run white people out of the south side of Chicago. That's the tension. They left. There was no, like, I'm throwing bricks through your window and calling you all kind of names. And, get, you know, like, there's a history. So I think people just kind of go along with, like, there's a history. And there's some people, luckily for me, I was around a lot of people, and I'm asking a 1,001 questions. I'm talking here, but I usually ask a lot of questions to people. And I think that's buried in there. So the new version is, is that you have all of these different kinds of what we now say people of color, right? And there's this kind of unresolved issue around, well, what's wrong with a black space to begin with, right? What's wrong with it being a black space? And what do we understand that black space being, right? It's usually unsafe. It's always connotated with things that are negative, unfortunately. Um, and I think these kind of conversations in this kind of project talk about the joy. That's what I was trying to also project. That there was a tremendous amount of joy and ownership around these spaces. It was not just this kind of like, you know, it's like they left. <laughs> so like party, like what are you gonna do? Like there was, you know, but there was, that's just one layer of the onion, you know what I mean? Because it was never just this one thing. I hope that kind of answered your question. You want to ask that second one? No. Okay. No, but if anyone else has anything okay. to say. No, I'm good. Thanks. Anyone else? Um, this is not exactly a question, so feel free to just pass or whatever. And, and I was thinking about it, and then Anton has mentioned it a couple times, privatization, revenue generation. Um, this, in so many different ways, is like a key thing that People keep running up against South Shore is my park, the one that I know the most about. You talk about the cultural center. You know, a member of the PAC, you go to the, the park district staff there, and you talk about trying to do community events, and they say, well, you got to tell us a year in advance because every weekend is booked with weddings. And, you know, yeah, there are these systems in place for community ideas, but then you run up against these very specific things that get in the way of it. The golf course is another one. The, and, and, but, but I want to complicate things by saying that, um, on the other hand, a lot of the attitude towards the golf course is um, development, money. Like, you withheld money and development from us for generations, and now you're offering it to us. I'm not going to ask any questions. I just want it. Uh, and so it, it's not so... To me, it's simple, but it's not to a lot of people. And so, yeah, this isn't exactly a question, but I think that it's an important, complicating thing to think about. And I often feel like the park district as an institution is not really thinking about it. <laughs> so I don't know. Any thoughts, I guess? Uh, yeah, I feel like that's, um, we're, we're butting up against that, right? Um, this. Um, kind of some of these spaces being seen as like that's where we get our revenue um, and I, I do understand that some of that revenue goes back into other programs and fixing other facilities but I think that is part of the these difficult conversations we have when we're able to focus on a cultural center we are small staff right in the way we're able to focus on these cultural centers a few at a time so that we can try to dig in and have so that some of those conversations and then try to move the needle a little like it is long it is long game work it ain't happening tomorrow <laughs> um, but it's like that's where we start and you you know keep putting pressure and that's how you move things Tag team, so I can go further. So, because that was a good answer, 
But I would say this is all get, like, as Bo as Bobby Womack would say is get down in the details. So changing the administrative rules in which how the park district runs is also part of the problem. So it took the power out of the park supervisor's hands and put it more centralized downtown, which is the big part of the problem. Because then you have people removed from making system changes in regions, right? Um, without being able to respond to the local demand or needs right away. And so then you have to go through this kind of inch by inch. And that's intentional. Uh, that ain't by happenstance. Mm -mm, I don't, I, no. I, I, maybe when I was 30, I might be like, at 45, hell no. The other thing I would say is that um, when you talk about the, the development issue um, around public space, um, and Obama's bring this up and it's not resolved yet, is that's always been part of the issue for black people in this country, though, of around, you know, how do you advance certain things, like what is due to the community, right, when you can't get development and what development promises, right, and what's the exchange. But I think it's much broader than that now in all communities because things have become, we've relied too much on this public-private partnerships, right? And that framework suggests that there isn't enough within the public to do what's for the public. And that's become, I think, this is a conversation I think has to continue around what's, what is the future of the public in a sense? Like, what does that then mean? Because the public seemed to work when it was a homogenous group that was benefiting from public assets. But when you complicate it with all these different variations is where you've seen, and it's, and it's tracked, you know, within the last 60 years, you know, in this post-civil rights, like there's a problem with like, there ain't enough in the public, so we need to get some private money to do it. And every year, <laughs> like we don't have enough money to do it. Instead of moving to like, wait a minute, I'm paying a lot of money and you're collecting fees every which way. Right, and then what we're not, so I think that gets at some of the heart of what, you know, your comment. Hello, my name is April L. Graham and I'm a third generation black Chicagoan. Um, I just graduated from Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts um, with a self-design major in black geographies. So um, one of the things that we primarily focus on in black geographical scholarship is how black people have been rendered ungeographic and how their uh, spatial agency has been stripped of them. And so the ways in which we understand black space is through um, a framework, framework of white spaces and protected spaces that have been place branded um, due to this, the fanatical need for a safe space for white people. And so we're disrupting that and we're challenging that narrative of um, having to constantly define black space through white spaces and what that means. And so um, one thing that I picked up on as you were speaking was you, when you were referencing where black people are located in the city, you said black Chicago instead of Chicago. Um, so I'm just curious as to what, what are you getting at when you're specifically saying black Chicago first, and secondly, what is your definition of black space in Chicago? Well, I mean, so yeah, we might as well just, uh, we're just getting real, that's a great question. So, um, and I was very intentional. So um, I had the pleasure a few weeks ago of uh, doing an interview with uh, Timuel Black, right? Who's just, you know, 100 year old centurion. He's been like, he came in 1919, uh, you know, so he was a baby. When I, say, when I say black Chicago, I'm trying to eat, what I'm saying is in, intentional around um, the south and west sides of the city, particular. But what I'm also saying, um, you know, as I was talking about earlier, as I was talking about the parks, and like, I think, and we talk about this sometimes, like our bubble, like living in a space where you like, our shit is dope, you know what I mean? Like being in the hood was like the shit. And I don't know what this other stuff was talking about that we're being told about living in the quote unquote ghetto, right? And for, for many of my cadre of folks who grew up, the, you know, parents who were artists and who were, you know, working at Walgreens, it was a hodgepodge. But what was not limited was the imagination of like what we were able to do as Africans that we do all over the globe. So I was 
taught that early, like, this is, the, this, this is what we do. So in my mind, I'm always speaking from that point of view. And I think sometimes I have to be conscious that, you know what I mean, that might be misunderstood because we are global citizens. Like, that's the history, you know what I mean? Even before you get into the Atlantic slave trade, right? So I've had the fortune of knowing, like, it doesn't start there, you know what I mean? And that each one of these fabrics, so when I'm talking about Black Chicago, I'm evoking um, this sense of what people brought up north. Um, uh, and it was not just migration, it was fleeing terrorism in the South. And I think that is an important thing, like that fear was brought with. Um, and then when the industrial age ends is, and drugs proliferation begins in the late 60s, 70s, this is what we're dealing with now. This is what we're still trying to talk about when we talk about uh, Black Chicago. So I think of it in that, in that term. I hope that answers your question. We have time for one more question before we move on to the footage. Okay, let's see the footage. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you guys, that was a great discussion. Um, the footage I'm gonna play is from the George Reed Jr. collection. Um, I'm sorry, Dr. George Reed Jr. He was a physicist for the Manhattan Project and worked for Argonne Laboratories after World War II. He had four children um, and um, a, he and his wife uh, documented their life in the Greater Grand Crossing neighborhood in the 1950s. So, um, <laughs> coincidentally, it's also playing on that first monitor, so you're kind of getting like a double projection kind of thing going here, but uh, this is at a, uh, hold on. It's, this is called a projector. <laughs> um, this is an eight millimeter projector. I bought it in a state sale for $8, good deal. Um, and I don't know what that is. I don't know where this is. That it, it is? Oh, great. What are all those army people doing there with the cannon? It's uh, some sort of park. Um, I'll do some more research on this, but okay, so now this is in for speech. Um, I'm not sure which Reed's son this is. There were two, two sons, two daughters. Um, but they went there every year. This was an integrated YWAC camp, YWCA camp in Forest Beast, Michigan, near New Buffalo Township. Um, and I think um, just recently, or not recently, sometime in the 80s, they actually sold their 65 acres of land and, um, you know, for like a bargain price, because they said the camp wasn't sustainable. Um, but it caused a lot of controversy because then these very high, uh, very expensive developments were happening. And a lot of the old um, homes that had been on, been on the beach um, and built in the early 1800s and 1900s were destroyed. Um, so now if you go there, you'll see multi-million dollar homes where the beach has been split up into private beaches. Uh, they're not accessible. Um, so I think this really plays into our whole conversation about what happens to something that was once public um, and in use for all people that is now private, a private space um, because of money and budgetary concerns. That's Selena, his wife there. They, they don't actually. Um, uh, Dr. Reed uh, is no longer with us and neither is his wife. His son Mark lives in Canada. Um, 
his daughter Lauren, um, I believe both his daughter Lauren and son Philip are out on the West Coast. Um, they do have some uh, family here. Um, I believe it's Lauren's son lives here now with his family. They recently moved here. Um, so there's, I have three reels of this in the collection, um, but I'll probably just show this one, but uh, they're taken from multiple years because they went there every year. They went in August of every year. Is there a way to preserve um, Yeah, so <laughs> I didn't want to throw cold water on your future, what will be left in the future as an archivist, uh, looking at cell phone stuff, betting that not a lot of that is going to survive. Um, digital stuff is fraught with uh, obsolescence of operating systems, machinery. If you try to o open a Word 98 document, I bet that you cannot. So. I, me and most of my archivist colleagues are very worried about all of your iPhone camera footage, you know, not surviving. Um, whereas a film, if you put it in the right conditions, which is a climate controlled, humidity, uh, humidity and temperature controlled vault, uh, 30 degrees temperature, 30 to 50% relative humidity. Um, it will last for hundreds of years. Um, I've been to the Library of Congress. They have football field size vaults, and they whipped out an original negative of George Melies' 1898 uh, film. I forget which one, but it was pristine. So, um, so yeah, you can keep film for a century, whereas uh, digital, it's looking like you can't open stuff from five years ago. Um, I'm not sure what to tell you to do about this other than panic and <laughs> <laughs> print out your old photos or don't put them on a DVD. I wouldn't recommend that either. Even those gold ones, that's a lie. Um, what you could do is transfer your, your digital to film. No. <laughs> No. Um, yeah, there is a question in the back there. Yeah, you can. I mean, I think that's your best bet. Um, the only problem would be is in if two years, like right now, what are we on Mac OS High Sierra, when inevitably Mac releases um, Forest Panther 8000. <laughs> You're, are you going to be able to open that file, um, even if it is on a hard drive? Will the connection that you have to that hard drive, which used to be Firewire, um, which is what I was using back in the old days, um, <laughs> uh, uh, no, like 10. So, um, but anyway, like now that's a Thunderbolt connection. So. Um, and computers are not even built with that firewire connection. So those are the kind of things, those hardware and software limitations that have made um, re-accessing older digital files really, really hard. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just a constant struggle. And the only thing we as archivists do is migrate our material constantly um, if we're working with some version of MOV that's getting discontinued, while well, we have to go and re-encode it into something new. Um, like H.264 is still being supported, but they did come out with H.265. Um, so will I have to go and re-encode all of my um, digital files like that? And it's kind of, it does kind of spell out a nightmare for anything that you have personally. So I would say, you know, keep your original material. That's why we keep the films, because if my digital file fails, later on I can always re-digitize that original film if it's in good enough condition and we've still preserved it. Um, but you can hear more about this on June 28th at my archiving workshop here. Um, 
And I'll have a video archivist as well as a photo archivist here as well. Um, Candace, can I ask a question about um, when you're interviewing families for those who still survive, um, do you ask them like why they documented these moments? You know, we're seeing a family at a beach and for a lot of us, um, that's, that's not necessarily rare, but there is a level of like defying stereotypes and normalizing behavior that I think through the white gaze, some of this is rather rare. You know, you're seeing like this strange photo of this man, this that's dapper a, that's man. A car, it's a car show. Right. So can you, can you talk about like when getting this footage, um, folks explaining why they documented these moments? Um, yeah, one, the other component is we do film an oral history with all of our families. So that is a question that um, Jackie likes to ask a lot is why? why? Um, I think for many of the families, sometimes the dad, but we also have a lot of the, the moms being the one filming everything. Um, they were given a camera, they found a camera, um, perhaps they were already very into taking slides, which is, uh, these photos are um, printed from 35 millimeter slides, and so once um, 8 millimeter film came out, they thought, oh, what a, what a cool thing, it, it will be moving, it will be like, um, we can watch my family like we go to the theater, um, and I think then they just started filming whatever they did, whether it was, I mean, that forest beach thing, that was a family trip that they took every year that they wanted to film, um, Christmases, birthdays. I mean, just think of all the th stuff you guys film of your families, um, close-ups of small children playing with something. Um, and so that really became why. Um, I know Mrs. Patton, whose collection this is from, actually started filming because her husband Robert was afraid to fly and she was going to China and wanted to show him where she had been. And then he got a camera and together they produced over a hundred reels of film. So uh, but yeah, I think it is a, something that was very much limited to those with disposable income, so the black middle class, um, and those just technically inclined who just got interested. I don't know if there's like a, they, I don't know, all the, all the answers are different, but that's kind of the similarity. They, they just kind of wanted to. I mean, why do you film anything you, guys, you do? Um, because you want to capture something about that moment. Do I have to feel like they take them down while I'm watching the films that they take? Because um, I'm under the impression that there's a, a that people like to take photographs more than they actually like to look at them. And um, in my business as a photographer, I actually make money off of this, knowing that they're never going to be used for any, any purpose, and I'm constantly amazed that they're paying me to do this. Um, and so do you worry about that as an archivist? Because if you aren't actually looking at the photographs, then you don't have an inclination to archive them well. Yeah, I do think that's a, like, even personally, I often don't like look and scroll through my camera roll. It's also like prohibitive, because you look at your camera roll and it's like I have 5,000 photos for t from 10 years, whereas, you know, this is kind of like, kind of manageable. This was 12 reels of film. And you know, maybe they set up the projector one night or at the end, end of the year and said, hey, we're gonna play the three reels we shot this, uh, this year. Um, and yeah, I do think like posting on Instagram, do you guys go through your Instagram feed and just look at the pictures you took? I, someone in the back does. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I personally don't. Um, so yeah, I do think that that's a danger um, if people don't realize why they want to save something, they won't save it. Um, whereas these, since it's actually an object in and of itself, there was more of an impetus to say, okay, well, even if we don't have the projector anymore, I'm going to put this in a box in a basement and one day we'll get a transfer and one day we'll look at it. Where if it's on your phone, you, you might, it'll just sit there and, until your phone dies and you get a new one. Um, so, um, so, 
in my um, in my senior year, I did a geoethnography of the black house community in Chicago, um, where I examined how they write themselves into the landscape of the city by reclaiming space through house music and house culture. And so um, one of the biggest challenges that I had with that geoethnography was relying much more on the black, I've coined them the black house kids, but um, relying more on the black house kids' voices as opposed to the scholars that I would use to analyze their voices. Um, so it proved to be a big uh, point of tension with my thesis committee, because um, the majority of my senior thesis is the black house kids speaking, um, which I thought was very necessary. Um, but um, I, I was purposeful in that choice because a lot of what I encountered as an undergrad was reading scholarship where black Chicagoans are st again stripped of that agency so we don't hear their voices or we don't read their voices and their words specifically because of the, there's very specific languages that black Chicagoans use and there's these earthy witticisms and all these things that make up what it means to be a black Chicagoan. And so um, I'm curious as to what is the process with this particular work to either so the public can either read about the background behind why they picked these particular moments to film, or are we gonna be able to hear their voices or hear those oral history interviews? Um, so the oral histories are uh, not up on the site. They need to be captioned. Um, but yes, eventually the oral histories will be available. Um, as far as reading is why they took a particular thing, that's not built into the site, but I do feel, again, that some of it is self-explanatory. Like, if you're looking at Kirk's birthday, it's probably pretty obvious why they wanted to film it. Um, but I, I guess that would be my answer. It's on our digital archive website, um, which you can get to. Um, our website is in all of the exhibition information and on the flyers and handouts, and you can get to our digital archive, and. Um, search by collection, by keyword tag, date, um, place, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, the, the oral histories are a really big part because um, I think home movies also are not built into the canon of film scholarship. Um, they're not considered primary source materials, um, and often oral histories aren't either unless some other scholars already examined a particular oral history for you to talk about. Um, so it is a, an important part of, again, giving um, that type of context as well um, to the home movies, so. Um, because a lot of times we see like films from eight millimeters, but I'm thinking um, in the 80s, this emergence of home video recorders and like I'm thinking of like 2000 when like the VHS went like and CDs came in, or the 90s rather. Um, like, all, do you guys get a lot of archival stuff from, like, because I'm just thinking when she was mentioning, like, a lot of the stuff during the, when we were, you know, housing around the city, uh, you know, there was not a lot of, there was Polaroids, but not, you know, and there were video cameras, but I'm wondering, do you get a lot of that, the VHS tapes, the beta tapes in to? Um, so right now, unfortunately, we do not collect um, home movie or video. Um, there are a lot of issues with um, archiving video. The amount of equipment you need is a lot more, um, and the amount of time you need to, you know, video usually could stretch to, it started at 30 minutes, it went to an hour, and usually that would be an hour of my time having to watch, whereas um, these are four minutes. So I can get through a much larger uh, volume in one sitting. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's definitely something we want to do, um, but as a smaller archive, we have time and resource challenges. Um, we've talked about doing partnerships with other, there's a number of other video archives around the city, Media Burn, Video Data Bank at SAIC, who probably have that material, but I'm certain it exists. But if people have it, I do have to direct them to those other people. Um, we don't have, we, we do have some, sh uh, actually some concerts and things from the 80s, 82, 
Gloria Gaynor concert, Summerfest in Chicago. It's pretty late to be using film in the 80s, but um, with that you get sound on the film, which is fun, so um, those are always fun to transfer. One, yeah. Um, so, uh, like archivists and historians are like gatekeepers of any community or like, you know, their historical uh, events that have taken place. Um, my question to you is as an archivist, do you, um, what's the process you follow to like compile the archives that you get, um, especially with respect to like representation of people since a lot of the footages would be from middle class, upper middle class, or like well-off families. So is it a concern for you as an archivist that a lot of re representation is not even getting documented? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's also why we want to collect video. Video opens up that economic spectrum uh, hugely because it became way, way cheaper to afford. Um, I mean, in any public event we do, we're always mentioning that this is a certain, it is African American material, but it's definitely a certain subset of well off um, African Americans. So don't take this as some sort of representation of how every African American was living in the 1950s in the South Side. Um, um, but it's definitely still material that has value and is something that is often not seen. Um, so I think that's that's what we do is we talk about it a lot. Um, any articles that are written, we make sure that that's mentioned because we don't want to be misrepresenting this material as um, some sort of monolith of mid to late 20th century African American living. Does that answer your question? Uh, last question. There had that first. Uh, when you're talking about like differences and similarities between the Instagram era of today and the home movie era, it got me thinking about self curation. Everybody's so self curated today. Uh, and I'm wondering if that also plays into the sort of class biases. Uh, and to like connect it to the park space, like does that skew how we see uh, black people using uh, park spaces and, and beach spaces in the archival collection? Um, hmm. I mean, yeah. I mean, they're, they're not gonna film something they don't wanna film. I mean, I think that that holds true today as it is, uh, as it is for our collections. And Jackie always likes to mention that they're, um, is an element of performance in all of our home movies and even in your Instagram feeds. Um, you're not filming yourself being sad about something, in general. I know there's some YouTubers who do that. <laughs> but in general, you're not weeping over chocolate cake saying, hey, my life is so bad, guys. Uh, you're, you're filming something happy and I think that that uh, very true of those of these older films as well that um, I forget what Jackie likes to say but it, it's kind of like um, it's the truth but it's not the truth in a way um, it obviously is what really happened but um, is it a representation of that family as a whole I would say no um, this is one moment that they chose to film and it's gonna be happy, it's, it's gonna be some sort of celebration. All right. Um, all right, thank you for coming, guys.